Hello, everybody. Welcome back into debate night. We're back with our normal setup today, uh, or tonight, I should say. Um, everybody's in their in their own quarters. We have um, our guests back on, and we've got some new topics. We're going to talk all about worlds. Just went down here in Lynchburg, so uh, we've got some exciting topics to talk about. Before we get into that, yeah, look at the merch. Respect the merch. Oh, Respect yeah. that merch as well. Foundationdisc.com. Heck yeah. Unreal. I didn't even know we made that in a tank top. Yeah, this is sick. This is sick. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, before we get into that, we have a quick word from tonight's sponsor, which is Manscaped. Today, the leaders in male grooming at Manscaped are helping us spice up the hair care regimen on your head with something fresh. And no, it's not a new razor, a ball deodorant. Get ready for the game-changing new scalp buffer by Manscaped. Let's break down why you need to add this to your hair care routine. First things first, check out these thick silicone bristles that are 100% antibacterial. No more germs hitching a ride on your head. The bristles gently exfoliate your scalp, and the product helps reduce flaking caused by dry skin buildup. One of the coolest features is that it's designed to stimulate blood flow to your hair follicles. Increased blood flow equals healthier hair. The bristles enhance shampoo penetration for more foam and less product use. It's not just about feeling good, but a better a better lather means better cleaning powder. That means your shampoo lasts longer, so you can save that extra cash for more important things like a new video game or sports tickets or a sick foundation merch. Uh, you can also pair it with the two-in-one shampoo and conditioner from manscape for the ultimate hair care routine these products are designed to work together giving your hair the nourishment and strength it needs and let's not forget the relaxing scalp massage scalp massage it provides after a long day using this feels like a mini spa treatment it's a great way to unwind while taking care of your scalp simply put the scalp buffer is your scalp's secret weapon if you want to check this out and take your scalp from zero to hero with the scalp buffer you can get 20 percent off plus free shipping with code debate night at manscape.com that's 20 percent off plus free shipping with code debate night at manscape.com. Let's get to our, uh, our, hey, let me say tonight. something real quick. Say something uh, real quick. I'm doing like a huge remodel situation. We're basically turning this room into like the video room. And Ooh. then we're turning another room into like the shipping room. So that way they're like separate from one another and the also for like being room for podcasts and whatnot. So I'm slowly kind of working it out. I'm going through everything. Guess what I found? I found my manscape box. Let's I go. had mis I guess I just forgot where I put it and I found it today and I was very excited. That was a very, very nice uh surprise for me. So I'll be Let's using go. that probably tomorrow. Kelsey was very excited about it. Shout out my beard is getting uh pretty long. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Beard Hedger Pro is, is goaded. Absolutely like goaded. Um all right. Well, Brody's here and he is in his room that may be changing looks, I guess, soon. I mean, it looks different. There, I mean, there's like yeah, I see uh, cards over there. Yeah, there's like uh, I mean, look over here. There's nothing anymore. Like a lot of space. This is the frisbee activities. room, right? Yeah, I mean now okay. now there's a little bit of frisbee. The, the other room's a lot more frisbee now too. So okay. we're we're just you know we're just changing it up. Love gotta, it. Got to got to adapt, of of course. So okay, it is what it is. Um, do you want me to do my like man? I was waiting people? for you to do yeah. 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 man of the people. Got to man of the people. Man of the people. Well, I mean. I, first it was off, a different I, kind of episode last week, so that might not be. I, but I will say this: like people really liked it. Um, I don't know if it was because the quality was so good and the audio, and you got Silas doing all the ones and twos in the back. Uh, but people really did enjoy it. Top comment I see here: fifty-six upvotes. Loved hearing Brody call out people who complain about the amount of walking in. Uh, re- Relation to disc golf. One of the reasons I love dis- disc golf is that it's like hiking with an extra bonus. Um, and then another one was got to give credit where credit is due. The three guys Brody said would flourish at the two courses at Worlds were Isaac, AB, and Simon. They are tied for first, tied for first, and six after round one. Mm, yeah, when they all finished, I think, in the top 15. I was going to say main shout out to Brody because you named Cat Merch as a dark horse performer and then she almost won. Oh, that would have been electric, right? That was, yeah, I was. I also I named Holland Cam. Hanley was going to, um, what would, would we call it? We said we had someone that was like going to outperform and then underperform. Underperform. Oh. And yeah. well, by the end of the tournament, yeah. There you go. I mean, it was one of the underperformances of a final yeah. round. Well, realistically, if you take away your first round, then that whole tournament would be an underperformance. Absolutely. Um, anyways, speaking of overperformers, Hunter's here. 
Uh, well, speaking of underperformers, we got to shout out Robbie C, who last week picked both winners as his underperformers. <laughs> and one of the all time worst takes to ever come out of the channel, I think. Impressive. Uh, it's very hard to do, but hey, you know, he, he was on the right track. He just kind of took a wrong turn at some point. So he's anti Isaac. He is, he is thinks Isaac's not good at disc golf for some reason. He can't think that anymore. Just, yeah, I think he still doesn't think it. This is backhand only, man. It gets I, I'm, I'm here. Here's what I'm going to say. I here. am officially uh, just an Isaac Robinson fan. Isaac Robinson's my favorite player, I think. I'm locked in. I loved what I saw this week. Hunter's new favorite player just dropped. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. New, new drop of the year. Isaac Robinson. Right. And in honor of him, I'm going to put with PA3s for the rest of the year. Nope. Dang it. Nope. Still in the banger verse. Um, Gary's back, back with the bricks. Love it. Right back with the bricks. Covering a little bit from this past weekend because uh, I joined up with my buddy uh, over at Apple Pie Disc Golf and we were Bob us a video where we had to eat a dozen donuts while playing around at disc golf. Oh, Ooh. that sounds awesome. It, mm, <laughs> we had a lot of confidence and that confidence was squashed pretty quickly once we started hitting donuts seven and eight. And just did you each eat a dozen? Yeah, so we we oh did doubles. My. We we did best shot doubles, and each doubles partner had their own twelve donuts. Oh, donut. Wait, you had to eat one by the end of the round. A whole dozen yourself before the round was over. Guys, this is super easy. What are we talking about here? <laughs> guys, you're out of your guys, mind. guys, what are we talking you're about here? What are we? I mean, are you doing like? You are could, you doing like cream and jelly? Or are you, yeah, you doing glaze? No, no, no. You couldn't just pick glazed or sugar raised. In fact, six of your donuts were selected by your opponents. So, <laughs> That's tough. That's tough. Yeah. That's I really mean, you tough. You got six jelly filled freaking powder sugar donuts. No, the like, cake I'm not donuts. Yeah. Those are I think that's heavy. the easiest challenge of all time. That's so far. This is from the person who was telling Connor that he couldn't eat 12, a 12 pack of tacos. But you think you can do 12 donuts? 12 donuts seems way harder. Yeah. 12 definitely. pack of tacos in one sitting? Yeah. yeah. I don't. Yeah, Connor, Connor, doesn't eat that. Donut. Connor doesn't eat that much. No, you said you couldn't do it. I thought. No, he saw. He said it was like impossible because you said one of your competitive eating friends couldn't even do it. Uh, well, he did. He did a Doritos Locos Tacos Supreme, which is very challenging. I think the donut one. The donuts, donuts are like hard. half air. Fifty percent of a donut's air. Not a cake. Ninety percent no, no, no. of a tree is <laughs> air, but you still get yeah. slapped by them. These weren't Dunkin' Donuts donuts. We went to a local donut shop. These were oh, like cake, yeah. cakey donuts. Jeez. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's brutal. That's I can't get like, through two wondering donuts locally before I start feeling bloated. I, I mean, that's tough. We, all right, all right. Brody's coming up, and we're and doing the, the donut people, challenge. The people in the chat will let me know that. Yeah, that you're delusional. Hunter saying that this is a brutal challenge to eat brutal. a dozen donuts while playing disc golf. That sounds like a beautiful Sunday morning. Okay. That's Let's brutal. just leave it at I that. Think, I think we'll have Brody come up here yeah, and we'll so do a, 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 a donut eat off. Right I thought it was a donut every hole. Like you couldn't you couldn't go into the next hole until you complete a donut. And it was no, the first and it was the first to complete 18 holes. That would be an electric video. Well, this isn't donut night. It is debate night. Although <laughs> this donut is, night might be the good. most exciting I'll debate. Some night. Holes. I want um, some donuts now. What the heck? I do want some donuts. Yeah. <laughs> um, Lucas is here as well, joining us. What's your favorite donut, Lucas? Oh man, I I'm actually not a big donut fan. But what I think the if I had heck? to pick one, yeah, I know. I think if I had to pick one, it might be like the cookies and cream specialty from Krispy Kreme. Great one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. I can get behind that. Dang, not a big donut guy. I'm a big powdered sugar donut guy. Wait, do you know like cake? <laughs> like cake, cake to eat like cake? Birthday not, cake? Yeah, I'm just not a big dessert person generally. Wow. You yeah, probably like know. salmon. I love salmon. <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. You got him. You got him, Brody. He loves salmon. <laughs> you probably like salmon. If you don't like dessert, I bet you love your salmon. <laughs> he does. He does. <laughs> he he does. A on his salad. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. uh, let's get into our first topic uh, and get away from this. Um, so this topic is kind of, uh, it's kind of broad. So I'm going to start your timer after 30 seconds. So you'll have a total of two minutes. Um, but I just want to know what were your thoughts on Ivy Hill from a course design perspective? What were its strengths of, and weaknesses? And I, I want to get a rating from one to 10 as well. Cause I think there was a lot of mixed opinions on this course so i just want to hear the breakdowns i think it'll be especially interesting uh to hear gary and and lucas because they were not at the course although um lucas has been there before so um yeah let's let's hear what we've got here brody what do you think 
Yeah, I mean, I thought it was I thought it was kind of interesting to hear. No, more as, do that. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Silas just gave me the two minute timer. That's all I'm saying. I'll go ahead. Oh, oh that's fine. <laughs> Silas is goaded. That's all. Oh, okay. Um, I, yeah, I thought it was interesting seeing as much backlash from the players after the fact or during the tournament. I was a little surprised by that. Obviously, some of the FPO players were a little upset with some of the distance that they we talked about that last week. Um, but you know, looking at it objectively, I mean, I think the design of the course was great. I think one of the things that did very well is it made it to where you didn't really think that you were on a golf course. I think that is a very challenging thing to do. Um, we play courses that are on golf courses where it's very apparent that we're playing disc golf on a golf course here. I think they did a good job of not having it to where we're playing next to a bunch of tees or a bunch to uh, next, a bunch of greens um, or throwing over greens or, you know, the sand traps were used in a way where it actually seemed like it, it made sense versus uh, just being there. And we just happened to put a basket there uh, with that being said, I think the, the biggest weaknesses of the course, there were several holes where a out of bounds shot or a bad shot equated to a stroke and potentially two strokes where that same mistake on other holes you were kind of almost rewarded for it. And to me, I think that is something in disc golf that needs to be removed. I think a bad shot on any hole needs to be the same. So what do I mean by that? Well, you know, you look at hole 17, for example, if you throw in the water on hole 17, you have a nice little drop zone chip over whatever, right? Then you go to another par three, which is like, uh, that'd be one, two, three, four, six, I believe it was the downhill mm -hmm. one. Yeah. That one, you throw a shot. You could be a hundred feet down the hill, tap in par. Uh, the other one was like 14. I want to say on the back nine, the really long, uh, par three downhill that was had hazard on the left. That would be told be on the right. It was at 12 and then OB behind same thing. You go OB long. You've got like a 20 footer. I'm not yeah. a huge fan. Oh, am I out of time already? Oh, geez. Okay. Well, one out of 10. Let's hear it. Uh, a one out of 10. Uh, I give it like an 8.5. Okay. Okay. I do agree with you. I think that the, um, the inconsistencies in the, those par threes and, and that's the all it was yeah. risk reward was that it was an interesting design design choice. I should say, uh, Hunter, what do you got? Well, I think one of the, the most important parts of the course design that I think really was did great here was the thought of spectator experience, um, because with how many tickets and stuff were being sold, there was a lot of the property that like could have been used differently, um, but it would have resulted in worse viewer, viewing experience. And I definitely felt like there was a lot of thought into where are spectators going to go, where, you know, pretty much the entire gallery is going to be able to see every shot. And that's what made it like from a fan perspective, if you were on the ground, it was better than new London. It just was like, you got to your experience out there was just world different from new London. Um, now at course design, when it comes to playing, I think this course did a lot of great things. And I think it had a few flaws that upset people to where they're just being really loud about it. Some of the strengths is I really liked the way it made players think there wasn't very many holes where you could just chuck a disc down there. Um, it baited players into some more risky plays where they were attacking on certain greens and stuff that there was a lot of risk there with not a lot of reward, but players were getting baited into it. Um, it also didn't ask a lot of players to get to the landing zones. It instead asked a lot of players to approach those landing zones with touch and on certain angles. Cause you could just throw a spy Kaiser in and a lot of times it was just skipping OB versus we saw Isaac throwing a lot of flippy stuff or stuff where it was a landing a lot softer and that's why he was able to slice and dice this course up weaknesses i think there was just greens that were a little too gimmicky at times brody brought up hole you know 17 hole uh six hole 14 there was a lot of that where i think greens were just a bit too much um and it, it didn't fully uh didn't fully capitalize on what the property had out there, I think. But the, the big key to me was just the four, five, and six stretch. I think those three holes in a row, neither, none of them were great holes. Five, I think, was fine. But I think being bookended with four and six, which really a lot of players didn't like, I think that led to that stretch. You kind of got off and half of the first third of the course wasn't great, which put a bad taste in people's mouth, which then led to them thinking, I'm not going to like this course regardless of what, what rest feeds me. One out of ten, one to ten rating, I'm going with an 8.2. Oh, oh, getting even more specific. I like it. Um, all right. So now we've got two guys who 
were not on the site for Worlds, but obviously watch closely. So curious to hear your opinions. Gary, what did you think of the course? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the world, so everyone's going to have their unique opinion about stuff. Um, as a venue, it was it was stellar. But, you know, let's talk about the course itself. Um, as a spectator watching from home, from a spectating perspective uh, over the Internet, I'd give the course a seven. I was a little worried it was going to come off like another Emporia, which is probably the only event you can fall asleep on, wake up and still think you're on the same hole. Um, but the holes out there were definitely dynamic enough that it was, it was really super entertaining. And I felt like with uh, the setup of 14 through 18, there was no lead that was ever going to be truly safe. As a player, I think the course is probably an eight. Um, I'll give it an 8.06 to get even more granular. Um, mm. But some some great holes had some unique shot shapes, and I felt like it had a combination of like required power and angle control um, that you had to have. And the course definitely made the top pros uh, consider going for par in some cases, which is kind of unique. And the course beat up the field. If you counted them all up, there were a combined 4,306 OB strokes between oh. both fields across the week. Wow. Um, and I know that there are several holes that definitely needed some adjustments. Like we've mentioned some already, like hole six needs less of a bailout with the OB behind the basket. 14 had the uh, the green issue where I don't mind the hole design, but maybe place the basket on a part of the hill where it's just grass or move it back and make it a par five. Because there are holes on tour that have angled sideways greens. They just utilize a more uniform landing space for them. And 17 could use some some trimming of the trees or, or you know a landing zone change. But I think one of the things that we're not talking about a lot that I really like that came from Aaron Gossage was he talked about the use of drop zones out there. Aside from hole 17, in most of the cases, the drop zones were placed in spots where it would be the worst inbounds position you could have on the fairway. So it didn't reward players um, who had bad shots. It actually punished them with tougher positions. And I like the use of hazard areas, bringing uh, players to decide where they wanted to miss if they were going to miss. But at the end of the day, it's the first time that the course has had it on, been on stage like this. I think a 10 out of 10 course exists out there. And it was a great juxtaposition between New London for testing the entire skill set of the players. Yeah, yeah, definitely some um, some interesting uh, uses of the hazard as well. Like you mentioned, I, I thought that was creative. Um, Lucas, wrap it up for us. What do you think of Ivy Hills as a course? Yeah, as Trevor mentioned, uh, I have played there before, so I do have a little bit of on-site perspective. Some things changed since I was there, um, but I do definitely like what Gary said about it challenging, being a great complement to New London. Overall, I think I'm going to give this course a 7.8 out of 10. It has some really great holes and some definite pluses, bonuses built in, but it also had some problems as well. So some of the strengths, I really like that it requires decision-making and puts the onus on the second shot more than the drive. I think that's something that disc golf has been lacking in the past. If you throw a better than average drive on some holes, the hole is basically over because the approach is essentially assured. I think of a course like Idlewild or something like that. Um, the new course at uh, European Open this year, as well as the Gorge at North Cove, which was where the Blue Ridge Classic was played, or the Blue Ridge Championship was played last year, are two great examples of that new emphasis on that course design aspect. Um, I think also it was a very cerebral course that challenged distance control and angle control off the tee, even though the tee shots, as I think someone else already mentioned, even though the tee shots might have been somewhat boring, it didn't come off on camera how important it was to control the, the angle at which it was coming in. If you're throwing a hyzer, it's going to skip OB. If you land more flat or more low, like uh, Calvin or an Isaac might throw, there was a better chance it was going to stay in a prime position and also avoid skipping OB as much. Um, I think it rewarded aggressive shots off the tee and made the shorter, made approach shots shorter, easier, and less technical if you got more aggressive. And then it it, when you executed that uh, correctly, and if you didn't, then you got punished by going OB. Um, I also really like the island holes where a proper miss had to be considered on all of them. In terms of optics, I thought it was really pretty. I think the weaknesses have already been mentioned. Uh, for or obviously need some work. I think there was also a little bit too much of a premium on flat to high as shots off the tee. I counted up 11 or 12 out of 18 holes. That's what you were throwing off the tee as the best option. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it was a curious one to break down. Honestly, I, I was really undecided on the course. Um, a lot of the week. I, I do think that at the end of the day, what most people will agree was it was a solid course with a few pretty notable bad holes that just need some changes because I think that that, I think those stuck out like sore thumbs and maybe overshadowed some of the slightly above average holes. So curious to see if, um, if when disc golf eventually makes its way back to that property, if, if they make those changes or if they just kind of double down because well, 
one adi- I was going to say one additional thing. Um, I mean, I think New London does a great job of of testing, you know, where you step up to the hole and we all know the the right throw is a forehand and there's some holes like 16 at New London like you cannot get a backhand to the basket. It's it's impossible. So, um I, I think New London has some good forehand holes. Uh Ivy there was not a single hole that required a forehand off the tee, yeah. which is obviously a lot harder to do when you're out in the open for sure. Uh, but there is definitely things you can do with mandos or designing the fairway in a way to where forehand makes a lot of sense. Um, it, it, that was the only thing is like, I, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of that of where yeah. it's like, Hey, this is, this is an 80% forehand hole. You can throw a backhand, but a forehand's way better. And I don't think other than uh, 13, the hole that we talked about earlier, that was the only hole that a forehand really made a little bit more of an advantage, but not even that much. Even 18, you think? 18 is a perfect turnover backhand. Yeah, there's okay. a good bit of room for the turn, but yeah, there, there really wasn't any specific. Uh, the court it had the course did have quite a few unique holes. I feel like um, they had there, unique holes for sure. There were yeah, there were I think a lot of risks taken on that design, and I think some paid off for and and some people loved, and others just didn't. But uh, yeah, I think there's definitely some promise there, and uh, a lot of pros a lot of pros enjoyed it as well. It mm-hmm. definitely wasn't just like a uh, majority hated course at all. Um, all right, go ahead. One of the cool things I just want to mention, I, I think more so than I've ever experienced with Worlds, this was definitely a, a weekend or a week of true disc golf content lovers' dreams because how many times before have we seen touring pros go to two courses they've never played before and have to do a lot of the preparation? It was great to get to listen to so many videos of people breaking down the courses where it's not like we're going to this place. And uh, this year they changed the basket location on one hole and they expanded the OB on the other hole. Like, yeah, it was so cool to see pros break down two new courses to them. It, it, it is really fun watching pros uh, assess a, a property, especially when you know it already. Um, but it, it would be cool to see the tour make an effort to try and include a new uh, a tournament that features new courses every year because that is that is so different because you're right you know you go back to the same old course like well i know what the play is here instead of getting all these different perspectives and strategies on maybe the same hole or maybe seeing a player change their strategy after a few holes instead of having it all locked in uh, before the tournament and just being like okay how can i execute this um so yeah there, there, there's definitely a lot to discuss comment down below what you thought of ivy hills of course and what you thought the strengths and weaknesses were i was surprised they didn't change any of the baskets being a nate heinel design course you know he started messing around with ledgestone i think there was three or four baskets changed throughout ledgestone not a single basket change throughout the entire tournament. I found that very interesting. Yeah. I think yeah. that that could have that could have added a little bit more. Yeah, it definitely would be interesting to see that in the in the future. There's a lot of places they could have they could have made some uh alternate pins. It might have been a, a logic of like we already have two courses. Would players complain that like, oh right. now I have to learn a third course even though you're just changing your approach shot slightly but yeah it all depends on what you're doing with the alternate pins like yeah are you really changing the shot or is it just like this landing area is easier or yeah you harder? just it's, <laughs> by changing the uh pins you can really make it like not really a backhand approach shot it's more of a forehand this day yeah um or maybe 14 you put the basket at the bottom of the hill and uh don't make them throw up there at once um, that was crazy they didn't put any mulch or anything on that that yeah. was wild i was i was shocked that they didn't take any of our feedback on that hole yeah yeah i was too. They were just like hey let's just throw it at rocks and see what happens see what happens <laughs> roll the dice um all right so isaac robinson obviously uh took it down he is now a two-time back-to-back world champion um a special emphasis on that second one because there's not many players who have done it now obviously we use hall of famer as a pretty loose term here the disc golf hall of fame isn't something super solidified so i want you to kind of perceive that term as you would think of it however it fits uh your own agenda and how you would consider a hall of famer uh valid but my question here is just simply is isaac robinson a hall of famer if he retires tomorrow why or why not is has he done enough already in his young career in your mind to be a hall of famer for what you think that should be. Um, Hunter, what do you think? 
Uh, you know, this was tough because I, I read the question and my gut reaction immediately said no. Like, this is his career's too young. Like, he's got more to prove because um, we haven't seen him consistently, like, win throughout a season like we're seeing out of Gannon type thing. Because, um, like, a Gannon Burr, I feel like if he were to retire, yeah, I think I think he's done it because, like, what he's do- doing this year is, like, making history. But then I did some Googling because I wanted to verify, am I thinking the right way? And I changed my mind. Um, the main stat that changed my mind is he now has three major titles. And the list of players who have as many or more than him is just so few players. And they're all Hall of Famers that it's like, and the people he's beating on this list are also, in my mind, a lot of them are Hall of Famers. So I immediately was like... There's no way that guy can be on this list. Um, the the list includes Ken Climo, Paul McBeth, Dave Felberg, Ricky Wysocki, Barry Schultz, Nate Doss, Will Shushik, Avery Jenkins, and Isaac Robinson are the only players that have three or more majors. Um, so that is a list. It's like those are pretty much all, you know, Hall of Famers in my mind. And not to even mention the fact that he's the only other, like the people that have went back-to-back world championships are just Ken Climo, Barry Schultz, Ricky, Paul, and Isaac Robinson. And like, if you're on a list with those guys for a, something as prestigious as this, um, I, I don't see how you're not a Hall of Famer. So I, I think that he's going to end up with a like for sure Hall of Fame career because I think he's got a lot more majors and pro tour wins in him. But I think even if he were to retire today, uh, yeah, I think he's in. So what other majors did Avery Jenkins star course win other than that world title? Just out of, did he win a couple of European ones? I'm just curious. I would imagine. Now, this is just U Disc. They update it very regularly. I mean, they even have Gannon Burr on has two on here. Oh, do you want to Japan? Man. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say it had to be some weird ones. I just searched. Um, he didn't I win just any US titles. The U disc one, like they already moved Isaac over to three. Yeah. They updated. They I, did, I believe updated this thing immediately. I did an knew. Australian one too. Yeah, I just knew it had to be some weird, some weird ones because oh, yeah. definitely he won the Players Cup wherever that was at. I don't know where the Players Cup was at. Oh, it was in two thousand. That was a yeah. That was a major that existed one time. I think. Yeah. Disc golf history will always be complex because of all those majors. <laughs> then we'll have another one next year, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, Gary, do you agree? As is the uh, do the accomplishments outweigh the longevity for you? You know, I, I'm not a fan of these questions because it's not like disc golf has a really well super fleshed out Hall of Fame. Um, I don't think there's a world outside of an insane uh, injury or something that would see him retire. I mean, if he did, is he going to be the Derrick Rose of the PDGA? But all that being said. Of course, he would be in the Hall of Fame eventually. He's won three majors, and two of them are world championships. So do I think he's a first ballot kind of guy? I don't know. But let's run down the list of requirements. You know, Does he have a favorable standing and honorable reputation in the community of disc golf? Check. <laughs> does he exhibit integrity, character, and sportsmanship? Check. Uh, is he a competitor who's produced a substantial body of success? Check. He is, he has 15 years of active disc golf participation. Uh Oh, well, <laughs> you know, if, I guess he'll need to volunteer or TD for a year or two, but he'll get there. Uh, and is he at least 45 years of age? Double. Uh Oh, <laughs> so back to the question, I guess, um, Isaac, can I call you Isaac? Uh, yes. would you be in the hall of fame? Yeah. in like 21 years. So you best keep playing buddy. And don't let the haters try to retire you too soon than earlier than you want to. So I think we have to stop asking questions. Like uh, he's 24 years old. Do I think that if he keeps going, is he going to get in the hall of fame? Yeah, probably for, for sure. But I I'm tired of asking and answering <laughs> questions about hall of famers of 24 year olds. Things, uh, things you have to be 45 to be a uh, U S president and PDJ hall of fame. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I love, I love their requirements. It cracks me up. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Lucas, what, what is your, what is your take on the hall of fame argument? Is it, is it too soon to even have an opinion? No, I don't think so. I knew it was going to be tough to go after Gary and Hunter here because uh, all the things they mentioned are things I had written down in my notes. Uh, he's not 45 years old. He hasn't had 15 years. This is his 14th year in the PDGA. So on technicality, foundation rules, he would not be in the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you look at the majors, he's won three majors. He would definitely be in the Hall of Fame because there's only been nine players, uh, as Hunter mentioned, to go uh, to have three or more majors. And he's one of only five to go back to back in world championships, all points that these guys have already made. I think the biggest point I've seen online combating the fact that Isaac should be in the hall of fame is this resortment to worlds is there's too much emphasis on worlds. And I think that's just really short sighted. When you look at what else he's done, he won Ottawa in 2022, an event that 
Uh, obviously, it's not produced a winner um, in more than one. Sorry, the uh, player hasn't won it more than once ever. So you always have to be on your game that weekend. He's won in three consecutive seasons on the Pro Tour, 2022, 2023, 2024. I think that's an impressive stat as well, given the out talent has continued to increase. And he's won in the weekend where everyone is trying to play their best disc golf in a season where he's not playing his best so far. So I think that any other uh, conclusion other than he's a shoo-in for the Hall of Fame if he retires tomorrow uh, is just not looking at his full body of work and is looking at world championships uh, too much because he's done other things. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, all right, Brody, wrap it up. What do you, uh, what do you think is that would Isaac be in the hall of fame? Seems like everybody else kind of is saying the, the accomplishments are there that outweighs everything else. Yeah. I think we all agree that the answer is yes, but I was actually surprised. None of them brought up any of the points that I'm about to bring up, which is the fact that in the past worlds used to be seven, nine days, like long rounds. And when you're the best of the field, it's really easy to win when you have, you know, if you, I mean, look at who's going to be probably the best player this year. I mean, who Isaac could make a push for it now, but uh, it's probably going to be Gannon, right? If you look at a season long, it's the longer you stretch out these tournaments, the best player is going to win majority of the time. So if you shrink it down, it adds in the flukiness of someone just getting super hot and having one incredible round or two incredible rounds. And he's been able to do back to back with five rounds, being able to win both, which is very impressive. And then you look at the courses that he's done it on. That's the other thing. No one's really mentioning the courses. He did it at a, you know, putter mid course up in GMC, basically woods and open. And then now down here, which a much longer putter would uh, a much longer mid to fairway would open course. He did it at both locations. Um, that is something that happens a lot in golf. There are major winners that people are like, ah, yeah, but he won it at that course. That doesn't really count. I don't think you can do that with Isaac and you would be crazy to say winning it back to back in this era that Isaac did. That is more challenging than any of the other people that won back to back where they only had to be a handful of people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, definitely the, the weight of his accomplishments is, is pretty, um, pretty apparent. I think that it's always tough to assess like the hall of fame arguments, I think are always really tough just because you have to basically decide how much do I care about a player's body of work over a long period of time, just versus what they accomplish. Like for instance, if a player hypothetically came in in their rookie year and won all four majors and then never played another season, like, is that a hall of fame career? You know, what, what defines that? I think every voting panel or whatever is going to kind of decide what that means. And, and Gary, you're right. Since it's not fleshed out, it's really hard for us to compare to a standard at all. Um, we're kind of just have to go from our guts, but I think um, considering how small the list is right now, it does make it easier to say right now. Now, if, if Isaac got to the end of his career uh, 15 years from now and still had three majors, and now all of a sudden the list of people with three majors or more is much larger, maybe it's a different, uh, different argument. But at this point, yeah, there's just not a lot of players who have accomplished that in such a short I, amount of time. I would be, I'd be curious if the question was flipped instead of saying he retires tomorrow, if the yeah. question was he oh. plays another 20 <laughs> years and his Everyone accolades can. stay the yeah. same, like he never mm -hmm. gets another win. Yeah, Because I, th I think then you have an argument of maybe he's not. Because maybe right. it's like, well, he won those three so early, and the reason he's date? not. Exactly. Yeah. Retiring tomorrow, I think, almost helps him because it's like, well, what right. could have been, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Fair. That, that is a good point. That is a good point. Yeah, I don't – it'll be um, – yeah. Because Ricky's going to face that somewhat. Luckily, Ricky's been dominant on the Pro Tour side to where he's like yeah. – he's a, he's a shoe in But when it comes to his legacy and being known as one of the greatest of all time, the longer he goes without a major win, the more that gets tainted. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, the more we ask this question, the more likely it is one of these times someone will retire after they win a major. And, it's true. Uh, it's true. You got to just keep asking it. You just bring Gary on every time. Somebody is going to disappear. This is only the second time we've ever asked that question, Gary. So how about you back off? <laughs> Listen, don't make me. I'll go back and I'll look at all the notes. Questions. Jerry will retire, me. dude. I'll go, re go rewatch every single Jerry episode of the Bay Numbers and retire. I'm pretty sure I only ever wrote it about Rick. 
And may, I think Gannon. I think Gannon, Gannon. got pulled Ooh. up. All right, that's a party yeah. foul. Oh, party and Calvin. Foul. What happens if Calvin retires? I think we did it four times. It's also measure. the PDGA Hall of Fame. That Who cares? We also did have a just generic PDGA Hall of Fame question. You love yeah. the Hall of Fame, Trev. Mm-hmm. What can I say? Player he loves the, the PDGA. Hall of Fame. PDGA it's man. it's just me. I'm digging. I'm digging into the barrel, man. I'm digging in. Find, find the topics. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we're going to get into um, we're going to talk about the FPO division because the FPO division had um, quite an interesting tournament, particularly the last round. It was uh, Hunter called it a hot potato situation um, as far as the leaders were concerned. So um, the lead was continually changing hands and multiple players during that final round were squandering chances. So I just want to know with this FPO division, because we see this a number of times, but it's at Worlds, it was really visible. Do you feel like the bad play takes some of the enjoyment out of the event, takes maybe some of the prestige out of the win? Or does the errant play just create a different form of entertainment and unpredictability? Does it does it actually make it a good watch? How, how do you kind of process uh, that FPO tournament and how it all went down? Uh, Gary, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think we can all agree that we'd like to see high-level play. And with Kristen in the field, we've gotten kind of used to high-level play in a major situation. However, I have said it before on a debate night episode, I'll say it again. We all like to look at the car fire on the side of the road when we drive by. And watching professional struggle is its own type of entertainment. That final card finished together at plus nine. If you add up the scores of the next 23 competitors – they still finish better than the, the, the top four. Um, some of the worst play came from them, and they were plus 16 on holes 12 through 18 that final round. And, and listen, I'll admit, it as enjoyable as that was, after the fourth air ball from inside 20 feet, I was getting a little bit annoyed because um, it's hard to watch a top player in the world struggle with those types of putts. And listen, before all of you out there go onto your keyboard and type, she's still much better than you are, stop and realize that, A, it's an opinion, and two, top-level pros have higher standards and expectations to fill. Um, but the constant lead changes it might actually not be better than you though, Gary, mm, maybe the constant lead changes were, were, were entertaining. And I, I think that the bad shots also made the really good one stand out, which was great. I wanted to see cat hold it down. Um, but she didn't, it was great seeing her push through it in rounds three and four. I'd love to see Holland finish strong. She didn't. I wanted Kristen to rage from the chase card, but she didn't. Um, at the end, it just came down to who would hold it together the best, and that's Evelina. Holes 13 through 15 sealed the deal for her. And maybe the secret was having a stable voice on the bag with James Proctor, but the best moment for me was when she addressed her grandparents directly in the post-round interview, and I got to say huge congrats to Evelina on the win. Uh, yeah, that that stat of the 23 competitors behind um... – not being as far over par. That's, that's crazy. That's, that's a crazy pool right there. Um, yeah. Wow. Uh, Lucas, what did you, what did you think of how the FPO division shook out there in that final round? Yeah. I kind of how Gary took it, like from a group perspective, I went more on an individual's perspective. So I think that could be a good, um, whatever the word is. Definitely. I think it took away from the excitement. You want the best events of the year to be the most exciting nail biting event of the year and not a war of attrition or a contest of who can mess up the least in the last most important stretch of holes. Unfortunately, I think it turned into a bit of a crapshoot the last seven holes for the three players in contention. Evelina shot even in the final seven holes, including the layup on 18. So it's not like she made a huge push at the end to claim victory. She survived and did what it was necessary to win. So I don't want to take away from her winning because she did in fact do what she needed to do and uh, won at the end. Uh, it's just not as exciting from a fan, fan perspective. Next, Cat Merch was plus four in that same stretch. If she shoots even through that, she wins by two, two over, and she realistically has a shot at a playoff. Finally, Holland was plus eight in that stretch. Unfortunately, just a wholesale collapse from her. If she shoots plus two in that stretch, she ties Evelina. Uh, even, she once again wins by two. Even more than the big picture score, though, is how demoralizing it must be to lose to someone putting just over 58% from C1X in the final round and whose longest made a putt in the final round was 29 feet. I think it takes away from how well Evelina was getting off the tee. And unfortunately, that's all people will be talking about. And that's all they should be talking about. Anytime you come away from a golf or a disc golf tournament and your takeaway is putting doesn't really matter that much. It's really tough to see. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely not something, uh, not something you expect to see out there, but that was certainly the case. Um, Brody, what were, what are your takeaways? Well, I'll say putting doesn't matter right now in the FPO with the, the, the players that are currently in the field. Um, I think, I think also when you start adding a lot of OB and you start making, you know, challenging shots off the tee, then it also reduces, how important putting was uh, you, you look at some of the top putters 
on the MPO side, you know, they're not moving up the leaderboards nearly as much as we see in other tournaments where we see some of the top putters in the top 10, top 20, simply because it just turns out to everyone's good throw it inside a circle too. It's just who can make the putts. Um, here, there was a lot more, and which I think is what disc golf should be. There's a lot more emphasis on throwing good shots and making the putts. Um, what I'll say about this though, like, I'll be honest, like there need, there's a contrast to it, right? Like I like watching college football and college basketball because you get to see people make mistakes and you get to see crazy drama and all that. And then you also see incredible plays as well, but then there also is the professional side of where we can turn and watch all those like dumb mistakes that we see in college. Like those don't really happen anymore in the NFL or in the NBA. Um, but what we do sometimes see is players, you know, struggle with the pressure. The problem that we saw here is like, I, I mentioned it last week, Holland's forehand has caused problems in the past. It caused a lot of issues in that final round. Evelina, it's not like she just all of a sudden wasn't able to make a putt and was trying to battle that final round of like, how can I make a putt? Like she couldn't make a putt all, all week. Yeah. She hasn't been able to make a putt all year. So it's not like it's all of a sudden like this new thing of where it's this new drama that we're all like locked in be like, holy crap. Like that's why I was locked in with Kristen yeah. is like, wow, Kristen's playing terrible. Like what's going on? Yeah. Like this isn't normal. Like that is Evelina. She throws the disc top, top five and one is one of the worst putters on tour. Yeah. That no. is her game. Yeah, no, that's valid. Like if it, it, you're right, if it was nothing something, new, if it was something uh, unexpected, it would probably be perceived a bit different. And, yeah, of um, course. I, I totally can get that. Um, Hunter, what, what's your perspective on the uh, FPO, the finish down the stretch there? Well, I mean, the original question was, do you feel like the bad play took some of the enjoyment out of the event? And as the event as a whole, we at least got moments of greatness, right? We got that 10 under round from Holland Hanley. That was incredible. We got, you know, different battles coming up. You had the question of will Kristen actually be able to come back? Because even going into like round four, I'm like, she's just got to play decent and she's in this thing. Uh, the final round though. Uh, yeah. It took, it took all the enjoyment out of it for me. Look, I can only get so much enjoyment from, from the missed putts and the, I now have the lead. Let me hand it back to you. Um, and we see it too often like and, and i don't really know what it points to i don't like it just is it's it's very frustrating to me because you have a sport that on the mpo side we're watching isaac robinson during this tournament just be a master at precision and every time he slips up there's someone ready to run through that door and you feel this pressure of he better not slip up because if he does it's getting ripped from him then on the flip side, the exact same tournament, we have players who are just literally being like, can someone please take this from me? I don't want the lead anymore. Who wants it? Please, please, please take it. And everyone's like, whoa, whoa, I don't want that. Gross. Ew, who would want that? No, no, you know what? I'm going to shoot myself off the podium. Like, I, it was, it was, I don't know. I was just very ticked off watching it because, like, the FPO field needs, like, seven Kristen Tatars, and we had zero of them this past weekend. Kristen was nowhere to be found. Luckily, she came in third to kind of save her namesake, but she fell into third thanks to Holland. Um, yeah. So, I don't know. I was very frustrated, and it did take the enjoyment out of the final round for me. Yes. Dang. Hunter, Hunter passionate about it. Yeah. I, I'm kind of, yeah, I'm kind of the same way where it's like I – you, you, you know, Gary's right. Like when you, it's like the train wreck, right? You see it and like, you have to watch it and there is some level of entertainment, but as like a fan of the game and somebody who wants to see the game thriving and be, and look to a certain standard, you have to be a little bummed out. Like you'd rather, you just would rather see players um, challenging each other and pushing each other down the stretch. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to have the collapse where it's like, Oh, we weren't going to have a close final round. Now the final round is going to be close, but when it happens enough times, it's like, all right, um, at some point, somebody needs to it's do like something. on, it's like on TikTok. you, you scroll and you get that mm. first train wreck and you're like, Holy cow, that was electric. Yeah. And then next thing you know, your whole algorithms train wrecks, they don't have the same pizzazz. The FPO algorithm, man, well, it's got to be fixed. The other additional issue was the conditions this past week were perfect. Yeah. And yeah. so Very people, true. people watching know how easy it is to make a 20 footer mm -hmm. or to make a 15 footer. People also know how easy it is to throw an upshot from 200 feet away. They know like the level of difficulty that is. 
And when you're watching people that are supposed to be the best in the world struggle at doing that, and it's not just like one person, it's like everyone is struggling to do that. It really starts like you start like having these thoughts in your head, like, wait, what's going on here? Yeah. Uh, whereas if the conditions were really, really tough, then it'd be different. Like everyone's just trying to hold on. You're just trying to limp through the finish line. Uh, but Hunter was right. Like it really looked like no one really actually wanted to win. Uh, yeah, I'll say this. Had the wind kicked up out there, I mean, there's no telling what we would have seen. Because, <laughs> like, there was already a plethora of mistakes being made. It could have got real interesting. I think it would have, because I feel like had the wind picked up, we probably would have seen Evelina as the champion still. Oh, easily, But it, yeah. it would have made it feel, like, Brody's right in that if there's huge gusts of wind, a missed 20-footer all of a sudden doesn't yeah. feel nearly as yeah. jaw-dropping. No, you're like, it's and impossible to putt right now. It probably would have felt the same. It just, like, it probably would have looked the same, but would have felt a lot better because there would have at least been, like, holy cow. I mean, that flag was just, she was putting into a 40-mile-an-hour headwind. No one's making that thing. Yeah. Versus the flag's mm. dead. Everyone's out there sweating because there's no wind to be found. And it's just, like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's yeah. clearly it's clearly a mental thing, and I think the the oh, yeah. signature moment that points to that is that we were talking about it b- before the show when Evelina laid up that putt on eighteen, and it stood up for a second. Even though I don't think any of us thought it was going to roll away to infinity, she, she looked white faced, like "Oh my word, am I going to have to do anything?" Which just kind of shows in the moment that like fragility mentally there so it's like we need we need more fp and i'm not saying that all fpo players don't have that killer mindset but you're right we need more of that just stone cold killer mentality um yeah i mean there's definitely definitely some form things there that aren't going to produce the best results with just the Mm -hmm. way she puts uh but if you look at people like simon um, or you look at uh, Isaac, another one too, their putting style, it's very much like if they're off and their confidence kind of goes down, their putting goes way, way down real quick. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't like fall off the map of where they're not able to make a 15 footer. Right? right. And so that I think is the big difference is when people are struggling at putting, they still are making 15 footers, 20 footers, 25 footers it's just they're no longer making 40 percent or 30 percent from circle two yeah yeah it's um it's just yeah it's been an interesting thing just continually as we uh continue to watch the fpo division some some events you you definitely are getting more of a feel of like okay we've got some players who are legit and like holland man you watch her round one like that's a player who's in complete control and like looked like head and shoulders above the rest of the field. But I think the, the pressure especially just was really, really crushing them down at the end. Well, there. well, hopefully this ends up being a, a turning point for a lot of players, because there's got to be a solid eight to 10, maybe even 12 players that are sick to themselves right now. Thinking if I like uh, that tournament was mine, like, are you kidding me? All I had to do was average four under a round and I'm a world champion. Like yeah. that turn, like I should be able to do that in my sleep. Kristen's one of them. Holland's one of them. All I had to do is not blow up that final round cap merch. Uh, like there's gotta be a number of players that are looking at that wow. and hopefully looking at themselves in the mirror being like this off season, that all changes. Like Talk next about, year, I'm coming back. Uh, well, like, there's the there's probably, line. there's probably a number of players that aren't even on tour watching that being like, yeah, I was being like wait, I can be a world champion and never make a putt. Yeah. I well talk about another advantage of having uh tournaments at courses players aren't familiar with is you don't know what the good scores are. Like it's it's at least a little easier to predict the future if you're like, well, last year this is what won out here in these conditions. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, no, but to Brody's point, there probably is um, yeah, there's probably some people that were watching at home, like, huh, interesting. How much did Evelina win for that? <laughs> Seventeen grand thousand dollars. Yeah, like I'm sure there's some people that are making sixty thousand dollars, forty thousand dollars a year being like, Hmm, I'm not that bad at this golf. Like maybe I should give that a try. <laughs> yeah. Wait, we'll never I'm, know. I'm, um, maybe I'm closer than I thought I was, you know, maybe they're having yeah. those thoughts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. So we're going to talk one more topic about Isaac here. So Isaac, uh, definitely won the tournament in, 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 
a fashion that makes sense for his game. But I think it was, um, you know, we've seen him play the safety, the safety strategy before, but this one, it seemed really extreme to me. Like he was playing it very, very safe, especially down the stretch. So I wanted to ask, do you think Isaac's safety first strategy being so effective points to a course that was too difficult or unpredictable and choked out the field and didn't maybe allow for aggressive play to be uh, a really big benefit? Or would you be okay with this type of strategy working on a regular basis? And did other players just fail? to adapt basically i'm saying obviously this the the safe strategy is what it is but did it get to a point where there was not enough reward at all for the aggressive play and, and playing aggressive on this course was just going to punish you no matter what like what how do you feel like that balanced out lucas what do you think so i really think that again this is going back to like focusing on just a few holes i, I think isaac like i don't even think he really had a safety first strategy if you look at hole two at new London, he had a birdie look. He should have buried that hole both times. And that's a hole that a lot of people are playing for four. I think in the final round, he played somewhat safe on hole three on his approach shot. And then he played pretty safe on 16, all three rounds. But again, people were doing that. I don't think it was necessarily safety first. I think that the tour itself doesn't make people think enough. And so being at a course that it's not too difficult or too unpredictable, it's just that it requires people to make smart decisions. And that's not something that we see happening all the time. I think if you look at Joey Buckets, that's why he's had a lot of early successes in his career is because he just goes out there and executes very similar to Isaac. And so I don't even think that Isaac was necessarily playing safety first. He challenged the OB enough to go on OB on hole nine. I think what you're really seeing from Isaac is him just throwing simple shots that he's really comfortable and confident in because that's his game more than like a safety first strategy per se. I don't think that the field failed to adapt. I just think that it goes back to what Gannon said at the beginning of the week about Isaac. When Isaac is throwing his shots well and is feeling confident, it's such a simple game plan. uh, And on a course that can be attacked with a simple game plan, I don't think there are many people that can compete with him. Just look at his final round to Idlewild. He was shredding. Uh, Obviously, he had the blow up at the very end there. But when Isaac is executing... I really don't think there are people that can compete because his shots are so simple. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. He definitely, when he's throwing what he's comfortable with, um, seems unstoppable out there. Brody, what did you think? Yeah. I mean, there weren't too many holes out there that you, that people were like playing for par. Um, I think majority of us were trying to birdie every hole. The only holes that really like pop out, uh, like hole five, I think there was only a handful of people in the field that were actually trying to play that for birdie. Um, and then you have hole, um, 16, only a handful of people are playing that for birdie and then hole 17, um, with the fact that like you start looking at those holes, like five is really the only one that's like not fluky. Like if you throw a monster drive on five and then throw a great second shot, you can birdie it. Hole 16 is fluky. You're throwing a roller. I don't know if anyone, I didn't see anyone. There might've been some not on coverage. I didn't see that many people try to go air shot on that hole to try to cover. Um, And then hole 17, another extremely fluky birdie of people trying to skip it off the water. We saw people like hitting the tree and staying in bounds. So like there wasn't really any holes out there that people were like, I'm playing this for par. Um, But like I said, there wasn't any holes that were also requiring you to throw a forehand, a flex forehand or, um, Uh, a very specific tee shot off the tee. Like you were able to pretty much throw what you wanted, whether it was a flex, a hyzer flip, whatever. And, you know, I've always said, Isaac, it has one of the best and most consistent shots in disc golf. And so if he's able to do that off of tee after tee, after tee, after tee, it's going to be very hard to beat him. He has to putt poorly. He has to putt really bad. Mm. Okay. So, so you guys both kind of leaning towards Isaac, just kind of having, a lot of shots that fit his game and he was executing them well, um, less about the strategy. Uh, Hunter, do you agree with that? To a certain extent. I think that the way that it it was perceived by us fans um, is kind of unfair to Isaac because like the, the, when the dude is on, I think that he's executing very difficult shots, but he just makes them look so easy that we all assume everyone in the field could just do what Isaac just did where it's like, yes, everyone in the field is maybe capable of that shot, but doing it across the five rounds, basically as flawlessly as Isaac did, is just near impossible to do. Um, And so I think, I definitely think he had a more of a safety first strategy, if you want to call it that, than a lot of the field. But what I think it came down to a lot of times is he's just a smart golfer. Because what I saw time and time and time again 
is when he did mess up, he knew when this is a moment I need to just take what the course gives me. This isn't my time to get that stroke back, or this is my time to push and get that stroke back. Whereas I saw other players not knowing that line where they would throw a disc OB and think I've got to go, you know, balls to the wall here and get that stroke back right now. Or, okay, I need, this is the time where I need to push the gas on a hole. Maybe I shouldn't be. Whereas Isaac was more willing to, I'm going to throw these shots to these landing zones, stick within my game. I'm going to play this course to as best as I possibly can play it. And when things do come up, I'm still going to stick to my game plan and accept I might have to take a par or a bogey here and move on and get it on the next one. Um, and that's what I was seeing out of him was a lot more of, he was playing very controlled, very angle controlled shots. He was in full control of the disc, both on the fairway and on the green. And then when mistakes came, he dealt with them in a very think through thought out methodical process. That I saw a lot of the field not doing. Yeah, I think I think that was a very key point as well. Um, his reaction to the bad breaks because he was getting them as well. Um, Gary, wrap it up. What did you What did you think about uh, Isaac's strategy and how that related to the course? You know, so far this year in the 684 holes with scoring data on the MPO tour, the we saw an emergence of a new level of difficulty in the first event at new London and Ivy Hill, four holes have now made the top 20 most difficult holes on tour. New London now owns the first fourth and ninth most difficult holes and Ivy uh, owns the 19th. That being said, I think it's super hard to argue that Isaac's plan was safety first, just because someone plays for par on a few holes does not mean that he's not going for it almost everywhere else. I mean, you mean to tell me that safety first is being tied for fourth highest birdie rate? Uh, you know, he had, he was the only person in the field with a bogey percentage in single digits. Um, hole 16 average 0.4 strokes above par. So his play safety first won him strokes over the field. I think just like distance putting and touch things like preparation and mental strength, their, their skills too. And was the course too difficult for the field? I don't think it was, but if it was, I don't even care because it's the world championships. This is supposed to be about the best players in the world. Professionals need to be challenged both physically and mentally. And I think both of these courses demanded a, a very cerebral approach. And Isaac did his homework, his mastery of the landing zones at his tournament best 76% scramble rate got the job done this weekend and if other pros aren't taking notes on this safety first strategy they're crazy yeah, yeah. i want to i want to push back on hunter and because he was saying that he thought isaac did play safety first and in my mind a safety I said, like i said if we want to call what his strategy was quote unquote safety first I, I know but you're saying like he was playing okay wait so you don't think he was playing safe no I mean, I think he was trying to birdie all, but I know he wasn't trying to birdie hole 16, 16. at Ivy and, and five, maybe five. hole six at New London. But five, I, sure that, I, think, I and, think it's a little five presumptuous and six, to say five that. Five and 16 were the two holes he was not playing for birdie. I, I do think yeah. it's a little presumptuous to say playing for birdie equals not safety. I think that so, there's plenty of holes in that course that you can do both. So so something that like Isaac did, for example, is like look at hole eight. All right. Hole eight, Eagle had one of the, the sickest drives. That, did you guys see that drive on hole eight from Eagle? He went, past, he went past the tree. I'm not Jeez. sure I did. No, I didn't see it. So oh, he seven, got around that tree. He went his he, his tee shot landed past the tree Holy on the hill. Smokes, right? Super easy birdie from there. But is it also kind of an easy birdie if you just throw like a four hundred foot turnover shot and then yes. it's a hyzer, right? right? And so like that's what I think like Isaac did a great job of is he never did anything that you know could Isaac birdie hole sixteen a hundred percent a hundred percent. But he he was looking at the numbers. It was like the chances of me burning this are probably so slim that it makes no sense for me to go for it. So I think Isaac did a great job. Same thing like um, uh, what's the super downhill hole? I'm, ten. I'm, ten. Is it ten? Yeah. Par four that goes super downhill and then back uphill. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's another hole. People were trying were, were throwing their tee shots way too far off their tee. And when you go too far, it actually starts getting steeper. And what was happening is guys diss when they were getting to the ground because it was going more and more downhill, they were landing more vertical and then they're flipping and then rolling. If you landed up top higher, the roll was never a problem. You, you were never scared of the roll. So those were things that I think players, some players figured out and did, but 
yeah, I, I guess I agree then with Hunter is like the shots were not easy that he was doing. Mm-hmm. Like, look at the par five, hole 15. Like, I would love to see people go out there and throw that putter shot that he was throwing on a par five and land it inbounds. Yeah. Like, he's landing yeah. it still in a very small spot. Yeah, he was definitely It's just executing. a shot that's really good for him to do, and he's executing it. Right. Yeah. I got yeah. one more thing about his game plan. Sorry, go ahead, guys. Good. Good. I was just going to say, I, just, I, I think how I would have – how I would describe his game is I think he just out golfed the field. Like he just, he just thought through the course in such a way in his preparation that he just played better golf. Like he just, the, I don't, the I wouldn't agree with that. I think there was a lot of people that were, that were playing smart. They just didn't do it nearly as well. Execution wise. Maybe they were attempting. Yeah. It just yeah, wasn't, it didn't work out. There wasn't every, you know, I think Nicklaus did a great job yeah, of playing yeah, that yeah. course. The lead, the lead card. Yeah. You know? I'll agree. They, they did. It's just, he wasn't messing up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it also comes down to like preferred angle of release. I think the, a lot of the field likes to throw on Heiser more than anything else. And Isaac's preferred angle is flat. And so I think that flat is just more controllable than Heiser. And you also saw like Niklas and uh, Joey doing well out there on those courses because they also like that flat release more than a Heiser, which is more controllable as well, I think. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I... I mean, at the end of the day, Isaac, he did. Yeah. He, he, like, if you watched anybody, he did execute his shots better than everybody else. But I, I definitely, and, and I agree with Hunter too. I think the number one thing that he, that he had above everybody was his reaction to bad breaks. Cause I think yeah. the, the hardest thing was like, okay, so you have players like Gannon and Calvin and Simon, who at times were making big pushes on that course. And it seemed like, they would get shut down at, at one point or another. And it's okay. Is that shut down coming from their own poor decisions or just, is this course just never going to re- reward an aggressive play? And I think it's a little different than certain tour courses where you feel like guys get going downhill. They keep getting more and more aggressive and it pays off. Whereas this course, it seemed like that was getting punished for one reason or another. Well, and, and the thing that I think that, you know, in an ideal world, if someone throws a bad shot, it gets punished equally from hole to hole. Like yeah. in my opinion, that's an ideal world. And I always say this, none of us are trying to throw bad shots, but they occasionally do happen. And when they do happen, in my opinion, I don't think one should get punished and another shouldn't. And unfortunately on Ivy, there are a lot of holes where a bad shot would get way more punished. The fact that you could throw your shot on hole 13 never once inbounds in advance 400 feet down the fairway like that that's, that's crazy to me right like that's to me that's wild where on hole two if you throw your shot ob to the right and it never comes back in bounds like that's a massive mistake on that hole because now you're having to throw an up shot 200 feet away like mm-hmm. to me like that's where like i just think disc golf still needs to work on the rules of how to play disc golf so that way shots like that both get punished and not one gets rewarded with a jump putt drop zone putt and another yeah. gets you know hey no you got to throw from way back here it's like we definitely saw one of the biggest but, varieties of of that kind of ob structure that we ever see mm-hmm. isn't sports in general though brody like the story of trying to make the least egregious mistake possible like even in baseball if you if you're throwing a curveball in baseball your mm-hmm. miss is you want it to be hitting the plate if you hang a curveball, that guy's sitting that ball 500 feet. If you're in the MLB, if you hit the plate on a curveball, it's a ball. So in this, yeah, but I everyone, think of- but everyone that throws that same pitch, it's the same for everyone. It's not, it's not different from one pitcher to the other. That's what I'm but saying. I'm saying. I was talking about mistakes in general. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm saying there's certain holes that if you throw a really bad shot, you can have a 20 footer for par mm-hmm. and other holes. If you throw a really bad shot, you have oh, to like rethrow your shot. I see what you're saying. I and thought you were talking about on individual holes, but you're talking about no, a different. No, no. I'm saying, yeah, I'm to me, it's just the rules that disc golf currently have, they aren't uniformed enough to where mm-hmm. a bad shot is a bad shot on each in, uh, on every hole. Sometimes a bad shot isn't that bad of a shot. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. If that makes fair. sense. But all, but also yeah. at the same time, you know, your competitors are also playing that same hole the same way. So I know, but what I'm saying, Trevor, is if you throw a bad shot in seven and I throw a bad shot in three, like they're both equally bad shots. Why do you get to have a putt for par 
and I get sent to a drop zone where I have no chance to have a par. We're both not I, trying I, to I, I hear that. I definitely hear that argument. I'm not sure we should which. Both be, we should both be struggling to get par. You could I'm argue that. Say. You could just argue that, well, on hole three or whatever, there's just more pressure because you know that you're punished more for a bad shot and you collapsed under that pressure, whereas your competitor didn't. Like, I, I think there is an argument both ways there. I'm not, I'm not sure I care for the inconsistency, but I do think it's a still a level playing field because when that other guy stepped up to that hole, you had the same odds as you did. To me, to me, it's more just on the basis of like if you're throwing out of bounds and having to have a disc come in bounds, that's a very scary shot. And if you both throw it out of bounds and it never comes back in bounds, but one gets to go to a drop zone and another has to re-tee, to me, that doesn't make any sense. I would like to see it both be played the same way. Make them both retee. That's what I'm trying to say. Uniform rules. I'm not saying, because I know like when we step up to certain holes, Trevor, like I know like this, this hole is really, really tough. Like I have to make a good shot here. If I don't, I'm going to get super, super punished. I would like to see when you step up to another hole that's designed exactly the same for it to play the same way. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's that, like we, we step argument. up to the same hole that's designed the same, but it plays completely different. Right. That, well, that's what doesn't make sense. It definitely, would, uh, it definitely would help the, uh, just the understanding of the rules in general. Cause I'm I mean, watching for, too. Yeah. Yeah. Cause for instance, um, on hole nine, the uh, nine is the, uh, yeah, the, the part four, the kind of longer one was only FPO using a drop zone there. Or what if was you go, if you go OB, I think you re T no, no, because, you go to the drop zone in MPO, th- but if you cross, you have the option to throw last inbounds or drop zone. Okay. okay. Oh, that's correct. Yes, yes. Sorry, right. sorry, yeah, sorry. I say it does get to a point where, like, as a spectator, yeah, there we go. There as you a go. spectator, I was kind of looking around. I was like, okay, so um, Joel Freeman went out of bounds, but he's not going to the drop zone. So, like, when does the drop zone come to play? It, do- it does get a little complex at times, but um yeah i think i think sometimes the use of that alternative ob like having the hazard in front of the some of the par threes is fun but at times it does get a bit confusing so size throw just just so i can hammer my point home real quick so anyone that's confused throw that hole up real quick size number nine and then also throw up hole 13 <laughs> so no, look, thanks i got sent him scrambling <laughs> well, no, no, he's oh, all right he's fast, yeah. oh, he's fast. okay so hole nine and hole 13 are designed exactly the same right can we all agree with that? Uh, yeah, like you have, a, you yeah. have to cross okay. it. If you, if, or, if, yeah. if you throw sure. OB sure. and it never crosses in bounds, you go to the drop zone, correct? Sure. sure. Hole 13, you can par from the drop zone. Hole nine, you cannot. To me, that makes no sense. They're designed yeah. exactly the same, but if you throw a bad shot on nine and you throw the same bad shot on 13, 13, you can well, say par. Devil, devil's, nine, advocate, you can't. devil's advocate, nine's tee shot is, is easier. Um... I would, also, I don't know. They're, they're, I less, they're less OB to carry, much less. Yeah, Just I mean, that you're, sure, you can, uh, sure, whatever you want to say. So if you're throwing I, an even worse tee shot, you have an even worse drop zone. And I think the drop zone also brings in a bigger number, too. Like, if you try to play for par on 13, we saw Gannon almost get a double bogey. Instead, he saved par. But, like, at least on nine, you know you have to play to save a bogey at that point. Whereas Gannon, I, I'm, I'm just saying uh, both holes. If you throw a B and you never land in bounds, re T. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And I, then, and then, I think a part of it is the PDGA is still like, even at this tournament, oh, thinking they're, terrified. Of the B, they're thinking of the B pool. Oh, yeah. 100%. Oh, yeah. All this oh, yeah. Stuff. And it's it like, is very true. We have like, people shooting 20 over par at the world championships can't, per round. I mean, you, what are we you doing? Can't, you can't have a thing be like, okay, but what if so and so who gets in the B pool can't throw it in bounds? And what do we do? Right. It's like then no. that person oh. shouldn't be in the field. There yeah. you go. Yeah, we're not. I I think to be honest, Hunter, with you, I think as soon as that happens, there's gonna be a moment in time when those type of players, because like the PJ Tour is not worried about designing a hole where it's like, hey, we have to worry about the 134th. Pl- everyone's in the field is good at golf. Yeah, we're not we're not there yet in disc golf. I think when it gets there, I think that is when we'll see a huge change in the way that rules are played. Yeah, yeah, which definitely. will be good for disc golf. Honestly, it'll be good for yeah, the growth sure. for sure. Yeah, the real right. MVP is uh, Papa Robinson. What's that? what? The real MVP is Papa Robinson. Yeah, two two kids yeah. in the uh, inside the what the top. Oh, 10, the cat. 15? you think that Ezra has to like book a tea time to get his dad in the bag? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for real. I, I wonder I, if it was like a whoever's in the lead. No, type I situation. think he. I, no, I think he. I think he likes to have his wife on his bag. I think is what he says. Oh, Ooh. fair enough. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I think shoot. I didn't. Incre- he had the hot round last round. It was, I think his experience. wife was on the bag, right? Yeah. I think he's yeah. like 11. I think, I think that's how that kind of works. Fair enough. Fair enough. What will be interesting is what happens when Isaac gets married. I know. Yeah, that's the big question here. Uh, we'll have to find out next season. Um, all right. Final topic. We've been on a lot of tangents, but it's all, it's always good. Um, so Hunter, Gary, Hunter, would you like to go first or second? I'd like to go first. Okay. I feel like this is kind of a Homer question, unfortunately, considering that you live next to this course, but I do. we'll see what, we'll see what Gary can do. Um, mm-hmm. So why do you think new London has become such a fan and player favorite? We heard a lot of people singing, pretty much everybody singing its praises during worlds. Um, nobody seemed to have any issue with it. Um, so why do you think it's become this favorite despite its lack of super scenic signature holes? Um, what makes this course such a success? And do you think it'll remain as popular if a large portion of the course is redesigned due to economic development? Obviously, if you've not heard of that yet, that is something that is uh, nearing the horizon potentially. Um, Hunter, what do you think? I, as I was thinking through this, one thing that stuck out to me is New London plays a lot of a lot of shots plays as a wooded course does, where it doesn't allow you just to play chip hyzers, right? But the gaps are so wide and so fair that by the time you reach a tree and you hit a tree, you're not thinking that was inches away from a perfect shot. A lot of times you are far, like many many feet away from a perfect shot, and that is what I think a lot of times when wooded courses get to be fluky, get to be gimmicky is it's like, dang to Brody's point, Trevor threw two feet off his line and it kicked and, you know, it was a hundred feet, right? Hunter threw 10 feet off his line and he's in the middle of the fairway. And it's like, well, with new London, if you're only a foot or two off of your line, your intended line, which is 95% of the time, the middle of the fairway, you might be pushing a back wall or something. You're going to be rewarded still like you threw slightly worse than perfect, but there's not a tree right there to slap you down. Really the only hole that I was thinking through that has a tree that I'm like kind of in the middle of the fairways hole eight. Um, but beyond that, the majority of the course is like, it's very clear what the course is asking you to do. Um, and it's rewarding good shots. And I think that's, what's making it. People love it so much is it's, it's very punishing to bad shots, pretty much across the board, very rewarding of good shots and very demanding of players to where you go out there, you throw good shots, you hit your lines, you're going to score. Well, you don't throw well, you don't hit your lines. You're not going to score. Well, you're going to have a bad day. Um, and it's fair across the board. So I think that uh, for it to remain as popular if a large portion is redesigned, it has to keep that feel. I think a a big key of the redesign is going to be very fair fairways with clear gaps of you know what you're trying to hit um, and asking you to throw shots that discs are capable of doing because that's another thing that a lot of wooded courses can get into where you're having to throw these really weird stally flip late flip shots that are just like i've never seen a disc do that new london doesn't have any of that it's very straightforward what it's asking you to do rewards the good punishes the bad basically across the board yeah yeah definitely um valid points there um gary what do you think why do you think new london has uh become such a favorite you know, I think as a course, New London scratches an itch that we all have as disc golfers, that there's just something about a wooded course with high ceilings, wide fairways that just, mm, it's it's magical. Uh, Iron Hill makes me feel that way. Northwood Black makes me feel that way. W.R. Jackson, mentioned by so many pros, makes them feel that way. Um, and unlike so many wooded courses before it, you know, holes at New London require more than just a skinny tee shot. They were, you know, they demand understanding of shot shaping. They force players to learn where the right landing zone is going to be. And they make you think about your angles and scenic holes are great, but I think sometimes scenic holes at courses are there to cover up some of the other flaws courses can have. While there's no hole at new London that I would call scenic new London has some iconic holes. As I mentioned earlier, they now have the first fourth and ninth hardest holes on tour. Um, and that would be hole six, 18 and two respectively, obviously OB changes there. Um, however, what do each of these holes have in common? They have wide fairways. They aren't hard because they're impossible. They don't have ridiculous gaps you have to hit. They're just pure golf shots, plain and simple. And, you know, you want a good angle? End to the left. Throw it to the right side. You know, you have to really think about not just the disc as it comes out of your hand, but where it's landing, where it's moving to after it lands. And the course doesn't really abuse OB. um, And another big factor is honestly how well the course is kept. Bedford County... It looks like they do a phenomenal job at keeping the course uh, just beautiful because it's never – I've never seen any kind of disrepair. And I know you guys mentioned that um, uh, yesterday. 
Uh, do I think it retains popularity if a chunk of the course is taken out? I definitely think it can because if it continues to celebrate the beauty of Woods Disc Golf and sticks to its roots, it, it feels almost like a spiritual successor to W.R. Jackson. It also helps that a portion of that's being removed is possibly some of the lesser appreciated parts of it. But I think they could do it. Paul seemed a little uncertain as to whether he'd be on board again, but it's 100% possible because of the love that the community has for that course. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think it, a course like New London begs the question, you know, there's so many people in disc golf that are obsessed with woods golf, but it's it. And you have to ask yourself, is it the just super tight lines that they love, or is it just being in the woods and, and, and that being the factor? Because New London, you get to play in the woods. It's a wooded course, but at the same time you do a very fair lines. And I think one thing that they, that New London has to its advantage is the majority of the field has only come and played this one tournament at it, right? They've, they've played maybe four or five rounds, including practice. So if you can quickly turn it around and recapture the feel of the course where maybe half the course or more is still the same thing and that familiarity, and then you just got a little bit of new sprinkled in. It's not like we're playing WR Jackson where it's been played for 30 years and, it, and everybody knows it to be a certain way. So I think that th there's a definitely an advantage there as well. Um, I think a lot of people have kind of hit the panic button, but yeah, I, when you don't have, I mean, think about it when you don't have that scenic hole and you're not terrified that, Oh my gosh, the water carry hole with the platform green and we're losing that. Like nobody's going to think about it that way. It's all about it, new London is much more of, of the essence of the course rather than an individual hole being the star. It also is really funny that hole 18 is one of the hardest courses on tour uh, or one of the hardest holes on tour because of the OB they added in. Like I, I never saw that coming. Um, yeah. but some, something else I didn't see coming was Hunter winning tonight. Congratulations, Hunter. I'm be straight with you. I didn't see it coming probably, either. Probably because that, that long sleeve shirt is so cool. It mm -hmm. is. This is very cool. Shout out to the world staff for, you know, creating some awesome merch. Very little of it, but a lot, but it was awesome. It wasn't very um, little of it. There, there was, was like three designs. Oh, you mean like design, as far as, yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. was one design used three times. Yes. Yeah. 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 Fair um, enough. But no, this was a stack. This is a stack cast. When I, when I loaded in here, I didn't see who was on when I loaded in and saw Gary Lucas and Brody. I was like, well, you know, third place sounds good. I'm happy there. So stoked to have this win. And, you know, I'm going to use my platform to just shout out and echo what Gary said of Bedford County parks and rec, really Bedford County in general. Um, I know this tournament was in Lynchburg, Virginia. I understand PDGA wise. We had to put that label on it because it had to be tied to a big city. We call the whole area Lynchburg. Bedford County is the ones that freaking did it. Um, Lynchburg Department of Tourism, you know, they they did a lot of work and that should that should go notice too. But when you're watching uh, the New London, you're watching how it plays and, and all of that and the amenities and everything to it. it. Bedford County didn't get the recognition they deserve this week. I mean, that's why this shirt says Lynchburg, not Bedford County. So I just want to, you know, give a shout out to them, the Parks and Rec Department, the Tourism Department. Um, heck, everyone I've ran into at Bedford County, they deserve a lot of a lot of credit that's getting thrown to Lynchburg, which Lynchburg, you know, I love that too. But just want to, the unsung hero, Bedford County. There you go. There you go. Um, well, that'll do it for tonight's episode. If you want to submit a topic to be featured on a upcoming episode, make sure to scan the QR code or click the link in the description. Season is starting to wind down, boys. We are now three majors into the season. We've got one left and probably about six episodes, maybe, maybe six weeks or so left uh, of the debate night for this season. So, um, and then the off season returns. And then the off season returns. Oh, so. We might have to get some of the fan favorites from the debate night season into the off season podcast. Yeah. yeah. Just for Can't wait. shoot so. the breeze. Yeah, we're almost we're we're getting to the the very back end of the 2024 Pro Tour season, which is crazy to think. It's been a blur, but we still have some exciting golf left and hopefully some exciting topics to debate left. So we will see you next week.